right, all right. Hey, what a great time of worship with so much that's happening in our world. Started our service a little early to pray, and we're going to do that next week as well. Continue to pray for our healthcare workers and first responders. So let's continue in that kind of attitude of prayer. Uh, you can turn to the book of Philippians. You likely know that we're there if you've been here at all. And if you're a guest today, we especially welcome you. And many of you are watching online. We're so glad that you're here today. Got a message that if we apply this message, um, it's going to change our lives. And so uh, we're going to dive deep into Philippians 2. The series title you've seen is called All Things New. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at uh, what it is to have a new heart, that when we come to Christ, he gives us a new heart, transforms our hearts in response to what he's done for us, fills us up by his spirit to live in us. And last week, we looked at the purpose, this new purpose we have. Um, Philippians 1, 6 says, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He's going to finish this thing that he started. What has he started? And what does it look like in completion? Well, the purpose that we now have, if you're in Christ, is to be conformed to his image. And Paul says, regardless of what you go through, he's in prison and he's writing this saying, hey, I'm going to bring glory to God. To live as Christ, die as Christ, can't lose. Okay. Live Christ, die, see Christ better. And so I can't lose. This kind of life is saying, hey, you've started a work in me. That's the new purpose. I'm being conformed into your image. And he does it mostly. We don't like this part. He does it mostly through suffering and through challenging. Because then we're able to prove and to reveal that our, our joy is not found in our circumstances at all. And today we're going to look at a new attitude. We're going to talk about this new attitude that he now gives us and how we can live that out in our lives. Some of you probably know that uh, Nicholas Copernicus, he was a Prussian astronomer who was the first one to come out with this idea, um, the truth, that the earth is not the center of all things. Now, I find this interesting that before science, we had this predisposed idea that we're the center of the universe, right? Like, you don't have to, t don't have to think much about that. Of course we are, right? But then he's the one who came along and said, no, actually, it's heliocentric. It's the sun is at the center of the universe. Even there, didn't know how giant the universe is, our little teeny galaxy. But, but uh, it was later Jean Piaget who came along. So after this Copernican revolution, it was called, Jean Piaget, the, the Swiss um, child psychologist, he's the one who said every child needs to go through a Copernican revolution themselves. Parents, you tracking with me? At some point, your child needs to realize I'm not the center of the world. And this happens from a very early age. I mean, it starts to you know, dawn on us. You can't walk, you walk into a wall. Oh, the wall doesn't move for me. I was going this way, right? Or you fall off of a chair, you fall down. Gravity doesn't cease to exist for me, right? And, and so what happens is every child, every person needs to have a Copernican revolution. I'm not the center of the world. And then we grow up and we still struggle with this thing called pride, where we want to be at the center of it all. And so today we're going to look at uh, Philippians 2. This is an incredible passage of scripture. This passage, okay, if it were a mountain range, I think Tim Keller said this, this would be one of the highest peaks in all of scripture. In this passage, we see the clearest, what we call in theology, Christology in arguably in all the Bible. Who is Jesus? What has he done? Even why has he done this? We get into the mind of Jesus. What motivated him to do this? And then, here's what's crazy. We too are called to live just like him. It's really a passage about this new attitude. This new attitude is one, in a word, is humility. And so it's Philippians 2. We're looking at verses 1 through 11. And uh, be aware, I'm challenging all of us. Our staff is already on this. want you to join us. Um, we're memorizing uh, verses 3 through 11 during, throughout this series. Okay, so do like me. Just jump into your quiet time. And as you do, just go over it and over it every day, okay, to memorize it in whichever translation. I'm in the ESV here. I think I memorized this whole passage, um, well, verses 1 through 11 when I was kind of college, right out of college in the, um, I think it was NASB. So it's a little bit different here, but um, whatever translation you look at, and I want to just challenge us all to do so, okay? And so we're looking at the marks 
of a new attitude and the motives of a new attitude. That's how we're going to break this down today, starting in verse 1. So if, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just walk us through this because the language here matters, what he's saying. So if, now so could be translated therefore. In fact, it might be in your translation, same word. It could be, hey, because Christ, we can trust in him, as here's what he's been saying. God's given us the privilege to trust in him and also to suffer for him. Like, wait, privilege? Yes, to be conformed into his image. So therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, this word any, we're going to realize pretty quickly, can also be translated because. What he's setting up here is an if-then kind of scenario. If, okay, because, we're going to see here, if there's any encouragement. Now we're talking already about motivation. Why are we doing this? If there's any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. Okay, so to pause there, this word encouragement, I want you to understand this because this is is a launching pad for this whole passage. The word encouragement is a compound Greek word. Um, Not that it matters, that it's paraklesis, but para means um, near. Klesis is from kaleo, you might know that word. Kaleo means calling or come. So there's this idea of coming near, coming close to bring comfort to someone. You might know that the paraclete is whom? Anybody? The Holy Spirit. It's called the paraclete. It's, he's the comforter, capital C. And so this is, the idea here is he's saying if there's any, if you've received any consolation, if you've been consoled by Jesus at all, he's saying, okay, believers, Have you been consoled by Jesus? Have you been consoled and comforted by the fact that he has come to rescue you from your sin? Have you been consoled, comforted, encouraged because he saved you from death, from yourself, from this self-centered life, from hell? He's rescued you. Anybody been consoled by that? And all of us here say yes, yes, and yes, right? And so Paul says, okay, good. That's where I want you. Let's talk about this. If he's done any of this for you, all right? And if there's been any participation, this is another word you might know. The word participation, literally, koinonia is the word. Fellowship, intimate fellowship. If there's been any fellowship with the Spirit of God in your life, if he's consoled you, if he's brought his presence upon you, if he's with you now, any affection, any sympathy, if so, then complete my joy, verse two, by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. We sang about it earlier. Just one heart, one mind, one soul, one, one life together as believers. He says, I got joy. He's been talking about that. But top it off by living this way. This is every pastor's dream. This is every parent, right, with your kids. Y'all, please, one love. One, come on, one purpose here, one joy, be full, one accord, all right? One mind, let's get along, right? Look at verse three. Do nothing from selfish ambition. This is a self-seeking uh, advantage, regardless of the impact it has on others. It's getting to the top by any means necessary, is what this word means. Uh, or conceit is the next word there. In the King James, I like the old King James, it's a word we don't use a lot, it's vainglory. Self-glory, self-glorification. It's a person who holds an exaggerated view of themselves. And we all tend to go there. I'm amazing. And then he says, but in humility, here's, there's the word, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Consider others as better than you. Who does this? Who lives like this, as we'll see today, Anyone who wants to live like Jesus. Anyone who's been called out as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's who lives this way. So we, we seem to know better about maybe what humility is not. It's hard to, it's hard to define and then harder to live this out. Um, what does it mean to be humble, right? It's like the guy who wrote a book on how to be humble. Uh, yeah, no, probably not. Okay. Um, like I'm so humble, I wrote a book about it and you can be humble as well. See, it's, it's hard to get our minds around. Humility is hard to define. We often, if you're like me, I'm thinking, I know what humility is not. Like what is the opposite of humility? It would be pride probably, right? We know what pride is because we're, 
well, we're well acquainted with pride. And yet nobody really thinks they're prideful. Not really. I mean, as a pastor, I don't have anybody really coming to my office. Jeff, I'm the most proud person I know. I need help. I'm so whipping prideful all the time. You see, it's so insidious. How about this? We're so sinful. We're so prideful. We don't know that we are. So we, I want us to get our minds around this. I really want us to come to grips with this. And so let's unpack this a little bit because, because humility is, is what keeps the gears of our relationships working. And it's why we have so much strife and trouble and struggle in our world and in our own personal lives, pride. So prideful that we don't even realize it. See, first, humility requires self-awareness. A lot of us aren't that self-aware. And James chapter four, verse six says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You want to oppose God? No, you want him to oppose you? Think about that. Be prideful. He opposes the proud. But he gives grace to those who are humble. You see why? We've got to get this right. We've got to get our minds around this and then apply this. So I want you to th be thinking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay this out, get real practical. How can I live this out this week? How can I live this out in my relationships? This passage has been all um, in my mind for a couple of weeks here. And I so want to apply this. I've been thinking a lot about this. Now, Stacy heard me preach this message earlier. So I'm, I'm accountable. All right. And, and all of my, my staff and friends, so many of you, were so prideful. The first thing is we've got to be self-aware. And the problem is many of us have pseudo-relationships. We don't have people in our lives that are actually speaking truth into our lives. It's like blind spots, right? Any of us could be driving home from you know, today on, on North Coast Highway or somewhere. It could happen to me this week. We could, you could change lanes and take somebody off the road because you didn't see them. You weren't aware of reality because of a blind spot, right? They saw you. They saw you clearly. You didn't see them. We all have blind spots, and we need others to bring light, to bear on our blind spots. And we need the right people in our lives to do so. Do you have people who are calling you out, who are saying, hey, that's, you know, that's not right? Are you willing, here's humility, to go to people and say, hey, talk to me? How am I being prideful? How am I the center of the universe here in this relationship or here at work or with a roommate? See, how does this work? See, God wants us to esteem, that's the word, others as more important than ourselves. But instead, what we talk about all the time is, no, it's self-esteem, right? We all need, we need self-esteem. Like if I was you know, like a motivational speaker, I want you to have self-esteem. Always feel better about yourself. You're awesome. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm, I need to hear that, right? We kind of all need to hear that. But think about this. What is, what is self-esteem? Like I read a post um, this past week entitled, Study Finds, Too Much Praise Can Turn Your Kids Into Narcissistic Jerks. <laughs> like we need a study to show us this. Excess, here's the point, though. Excessive praise for the wrong reasons isn't a good idea, a new study says. And then it goes on to say, that often the kid or the adult who has the highest self-esteem is the biggest jerk in the room. I mean, play that out. Like if I'm, if I'm here I am, I'm a motivational speaker, you know, you don't need to self, because self, what is self-esteem? Self-praise, self-admiration is what it is. This is exactly the opposite of the way of Jesus. And so, and so if I'm, I'm going to say, y'all, listen, feel better about yourself. Uh, you're amazing. Um, have a really strong self-esteem. You raise yourself to the highest level. Come on, let's do this. You know? And if whoever's in the room, the person that does that the best is the person who thinks they're higher than everybody else in the room. And we create narcissistic jerks, evidently, right? And so here's the thing, and this is good for parents to understand this. How do you affirm your children? If you're building into them a self-esteem because you're thinking, wait, isn't self-confidence, isn't that a good thing? Isn't like, like self-assurance, you know, feeling good about yourself? Yes and no. It depends on where you're finding your value. Is it in your looks? Is it in your abilities? Is it because you're so amazing, because you're so whipping smart? You see? Or is it, parents, listen, are we affirming our children for the character traits that look like Jesus? Is it what's internal, not the external? 
Affirm your kids for all the right reasons. Focus on internal character and the things of Jesus. What are you showing them? You value and you celebrate, but you play this out. You know, those with the highest self-esteem are those who just might be the most difficult people in the room. And in our culture, what's sad, the loudest, highest, biggest, you know, most um, just boisterous person in the room is sometimes the leader in organizations. This is not the way of Jesus. So here's the key. This has been so helpful for me. Humility means, again, trying to define it um, so we can apply it. Humility means that I don't think less of myself. Maybe you've heard this. But I think of myself less. Someone attributed that to C.S. Lewis. I did a little research. He never said it. Um, What he did say is this. He said the really humble man will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. Now, how do you not think about yourself at all? Like, I'm, I'm with myself all day long. I'm in my head all day long. Who speaks to you more than anyone? Yourself. How do you not think about yourself? Well, the scripture tells us. <laughs> There's a book for that. How about, they look, and it's right here. Verse four, let each of you not look out for your own interest or only for your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is so powerful. The way to stop thinking about yourself is to think about other people. This is so elementary when you get your mind around it. You're like, well, yeah, of course. Who lives like this? Anyone who wants to practice the way of Jesus. This is a radical way to live. Now, I'm ahead of you here in this text and trying to apply it. I've been seeking to live like this. Think about this. Why are we so anxious? Why are we this age of anxiety? And I get it. There's clinical anxiety and such. I understand all that. But we're anxious because we're thinking about ourselves. That's why we're so whipping anxious. When we try too hard to get what we want, to look successful, to be right, to get recognition, to be strong, to not show my weaknesses, to not show any vulnerable emotions, I, we become anxious. I'm not getting, even James says this, here's why you're anxious, here's why there's strife among you, because you aren't getting what you want. We're so prideful. Dr. Carl Minninger was um, an American psychiatrist, And he uh, did a lot of work around anxiety long before it was a thing and mental health. And and someone asked him how he would advise a person who felt like they were going to have a nervous breakdown, they called it. And he said this, this brilliant psychiatrist, here's the answer, lock up your house, go out, go across town if you need to, find someone in need and do something for them. That's how you overcome. By thinking, again, how do you stop thinking about yourself? You don't just, I'm gonna stop thinking about myself. I gotta stop thinking about myself. Wait, what am I gonna have for dinner? I don't know. What am I having? I don't gotta think about myself. I gotta think about, I'm going to this meeting. How do you do that? You replace your thoughts about yourself with the thoughts of others. This is the mind of Jesus who lived this way Every moment of his life. This, this word mind is the word proneo. It means intense focus. It's the heart of a thing. This is why I like the word attitude. Other translations are attitude. It's probably better. But everything starts in the mind. So I, I get it. Think like Jesus. Th- this takes constant focus. It takes a mindset. Watch this. A mind set on others. Not myself. Catch yourself this week, friends. Listen, you've got to have this attitude. It's been said that there are two types of people who enter a room. The, you know, one is, hey, here I am, right? The other is, there you are. There you are. I'm thinking of friends. I'm looking across the crowd here. I'm thinking of friends I have in our church who live this way. There you are. How are you doing? How are you? You can talk to people like that, and for the whole time you're going, gosh, I had dinner with them, and we can't talk about me the whole time. I mean, people who are like that, just good listeners, that's the first step, right? 
to be a good listener. It's, it's not about me. This is going to be like, what if, what if this week, every encounter you have, before you go into it, the mind of Christ, I'm going to be concerned. Watch this. You're going to be, I'm going to hold you in higher esteem, more significant than me as I enter into this conversation. I'm going to enter into this, not thinking about what I want, but I am going to die to myself and I'm going to consider you more important than my, who lives like this? Christians, this is a radical way to live. So this week, watch this, catch yourself. Pride means that you're going to promote yourself. You're going to promote yourself in small ways, in conversation. This is self-glory is what this is, vain glory. With pride, you're going to exaggerate. This is what prideful people do. This is how we know what humility is not. How do we remain humble? You don't promote yourself. We're all going, oh, I get that. Okay, that's, I get that. Don't exaggerate in conversations or situations because what you're trying to do is prove that you're right and you're trying to show that, that you're better than you are when you exaggerate, okay? Catch yourself, catch one another in close relationships. Hey, that's not real. You're, that's an exaggeration, okay? And here's another one that's been helpful for me. Don't defend yourself. Being humble means you don't defend yourself and here's, here's what I mean. What will happen in a relationship, this can happen in marriage or close relationship, it can happen with friendship. It's like, whoa, you hurt me. Or you discern, I think you're upset with me. You get into that conversation, right? Well, yeah, because, yes, you hurt me because you said this. No, 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 that's not, that's not what I said. We immediately start to defend. He says, well, of course you do. You got to get to the truth. No, no, no. If you have the other person in mind as more significant than yourself, it doesn't matter if you meant to hurt them or not, they're hurt. You enter into that and say, instead of, hey, that, well, I said this, but no, this is what I really meant. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say this. No, no, no. You enter in and say, how, tell me more. Not about me. It's about how you're hurt. You may be in the back of your mind, you might be thinking, you're crazy that you were hurt by that. That's not at all. You know, that's the right. But instead you're saying, I'm going to live like Jesus and I'm going to humble myself. You're more important than me. I want to hear more about this. And again, who lives this way? Believers who are in, in, in relationship with others who may not be believers. In your workplace, at your school, in your family. See, here's the question that I want us to ask. To have the mind of Christ in your marriage, in your relationships, at work, wherever you find yourself. What if you went into every sphere of influence, every place you go to this week? And I'm going to practice this. How can I help? How can I help? And again, Stace heard me. I might be really busy this afternoon. Um, how can I help? How can I help? That's the attitude in the mind of Christ. Serve. I had this thought. You can imagine the pastor's mind goes this way. What if every person in our church decided when you show up here, you enter onto campus, you have the mind of Christ? This is what we're, how we're supposed to live. And I see it. I see it often, but let me ask you, what if you stepped in, drove in, parked your car, whatever you do, you step on campus and you're like, this is not about me. This is about everybody else that I'll encounter right now. I'm gonna die to myself and I'm gonna see how I can serve. What if we approach church, every one of us, I'm here to serve. Not get, not consumer Christianity. And I get it. I love coming. It's been a hard week. I just want to worship God. Jeff, give me the truth. Give me some encouragement. I just want to be reminded how much God loves me through song. I get that. But what if we all said, I'm here to serve, and I could ask you, what's your ministry? And you said, well, I, I do this. What if you called our preschool office and said, how can I serve? The youngest ones among it. What if you? What if you're not here for you? And you said, "Hey, it sounds like the mind of Christ would say, how can I serve our children? How can I serve our students? What can I do with our senior adults?' I understand there's a ministry you guys are starting where we can actually go into their homes or apartments and do little chores for them. How can I serve? Because here's the thing, friends. Listen, to live like this is to live like Jesus, and it is the way to life." It is the way to joy. I've never met a prideful, self-centered, happy person in my life. Never. And to the degree that we give ourselves away, it's to that degree that we have the mind of Christ and we're living it out and we experience the joy that he gives us. These are the marks of a new attitude. But I want to encourage some of us today because I know this is true. Many of you are like me 
and you're just tired. What do you do when you enter into, we've all done this, if you've served at all, this has probably happened. You've been in a season of ministry or in a position, you served with children or you, know, you were with middle schoolers and you lasted two weeks. You know, and you're like, I, I can't, I can't. And we, we go into a ministry, or this is messy. The relationships and people, and this is all, this is, me- and we give up, we quit. Why? Because we don't understand that to have the mind of Christ means that we persevere, we stay in, and here's what some of you need to hear today. Don't give up. I'm talking to many people. There are many Christians. Not, no, I'm not just here in our church. I'm talking about Christians who are giving up. Don't give up. Because oftentimes, perseverance through it all, yes, through the trials, through the struggling, through the suffering, is what brings glory to Christ. This is what this book's all about. And if you're like me, you're tired. I'm tired. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of all the, the weight of all that's happening in the world. It's just the backdrop then for all just decision fatigue, right? Through the COVID, it's just a mess. And everybody's got an opinion about it. This week again, friend, his brother died early this week. I mean, it is, it's grief is what it is. And I'm just tired. You know, we have, we have people who won't come to church because they're, well, we're not sure everybody's going to wear a mask. And I'm not going to, my kids, and I'm not. Then we have others who aren't coming because we're wearing masks. I mean, you know, it's just, okay, and every, I get it. Everybody's got an opinion about all of that. And many times it, we're just beat down. And if you're not careful, I just give up. Don't give up. Don't give up because it's staying in. It's staying the course. But how do we do this? People give up because their motives are skewed. I thought this was going to be really happy. I thought people were going to applaud me for serving kids. And it's just, I don't get anybody. They, nobody knows I'm doing this, right? So much ministry is that way. But here's why we don't give up. Because all of life is a response to what Christ has done for us. Our entire lives are a response to him. So here it is. Here's how he lands this. We're going to talk about the motives now of a new attitude. We'll land it this way. Look at verse 6. If I had time, this passage is the most incredible passage about who God is in Christ, who he was, what he did, why he did what he did. This passage is amazing. Look at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, the word form is the word morphe in the Greek. It, and we often think of the form as the external thing, a form, the shape of a thing. But that's not what this means. It's the, it's the inward thing. It's the essence of the thing. It's an inward quality. The NIV says it better. Being in very nature God. That's a little, that's a little awkward English structure, but in very nature God. See, it'd be one thing to, for Paul to say, Jesus is God. Well, that's clear. But no, he didn't say that. He says, Jesus is the very substance and characteristic. He is God. And he says, he's equal to the Father in substance and being the Spirit. He's the triune God. And some people might say, well, but really, didn't they? I've heard people say, well, wasn't it later that they kind of thought he was, he was God? Jesus didn't really say he was God, did he? Like, did he? Didn't that come later? No, no, no. There's a problem with that. To think that over time, they, they said he's God in the flesh. And it's this. The early church had a crystal clear Christology because what Paul is doing here, you might know this is structured in a way, it's like a poem. Some think it was a hymn. Others think, they think it was a confession. Paul is actually quoting someone else. He's writing this about 30 AD. He's writing something that predates this. This is who Jesus is. He's the one. How in the world Could you say that Jesus was God in the flesh among Jews and for them to believe you? Unless impeccable life and they saw him risen from the grave. It's the only way to explain this. Look at verse seven. It goes on to say, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Okay, so he, he, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he became a servant. That's a softer word. The word is doulos. It means slave, being born in the likeness of men. So is it a form of God, form of man? Yes, and yes. This is what separates Christianity from all other religions. The fullness of deity dwelled in him in bodily form, he says in Colossians 2.9. And so we see here Christ 
Together, we see the Trinity. He existed, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Together, this is such rich theology. What we see here is that what we must do is do what Jesus has done. Friends, this is important in terms of motive. Jesus entered into, okay, the triune relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's in that relationship, being loved by the Father, loved by the Spirit, perfect relationship, and he comes out of that to serve. Here's why this is so important. We don't serve others as a law of reciprocity. This is why many of us give up. I'm getting nothing for this. Instead, we serve him out of all that he's already done for us. If all the love we need, I say this often, is found in him, I can love others without any need for love in return. That's Jesus. That's loving others without any kind of need for love in return. Look at verse eight. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, the point of death, even death on a cross. And then the paradoxical shift, we move from vainglory to verse nine. If you wanna exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. If you wanna humble yourself, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that, verse 10, at the name of Jesus, every tongue should confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. If, friends, if he's God, the only response to him is in the extreme. Nobody in the New Testament encountered Jesus, the real Jesus, and walked away unchanged. Think about that. They either hated him, and even still today, you either hate him, you're against him, okay, or you're afraid of him, so you run from him, or you fall down on your knees before him and worship him. Those are the only options. Nobody ever just said, well, I like Jesus. I, I like him. And yet, a lot of people do that today. He didn't give us that option. He didn't intend to. He's either Lord or he's not. And so he tells us we can live this way. He came to show us who God is and how to live our lives. And so I want us to pray together as we close our time. And then I'm going to have a challenge for you before we leave an immediate application of this text. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this passage of scripture. We thank you for how clear it shows us how we're to live. And Lord, we cannot do this on our own. We so want to live this way. Friend, just say to the Lord right now, Lord, help me to live a selfless life. Help me to consider my spouse, my, my children even, my friends, my coworkers. Help me, to, help me to consider everyone as more significant than myself. In every encounter today, every encounter this week, may I live like Jesus. And friend, if you're here today and you've never received Christ, and you see clearly in this passage, he came from the very top all the way down to rescue you from your sin. Not so you could work your way to salvation, but you, you would trust him that he's already made a way. Substitute on the cross, taking your sin upon himself. Receive his grace right now. If you never have settled that, say, Lord, come into my life. Make me the person you've created me to be. I give you my life in response to what you've done. Be Lord of my life. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.